All right, we are very happy to have um, Kai Sillibuck um, from IAS now, actually uh, telling us about Poincaré duality and bioalgebra structures for loop spaces. Kai, please. Yes. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, so I'm happy to give a talk uh, in this uh, topology seminar. Uh, it's a uh, well, first of all, uh, feel free to ask questions at any time during the talk. Yeah, I, I always appreciate having questions and having some kind of discussion, even in the middle of the talk. Um, so, so this one is a bit uh, of a challenge for me because it it has some symplectic geometry aspects to to it, and uh, and I don't didn't want to completely ignore those. I could have given a talk entirely on string topology, but I, I felt it's not the right thing because the whole point of this project is to bring symplectic geometry into play on questions of string topology. So I'm going to start out talking about string topology and recalling various things in string topology, or maybe also say some things which you may not have seen before. Um, but then in the second half, I will speak a little bit about uh, symplectic geometry and how this uh, then comes into play. Okay, so uh, let's, the, the, oh, and all this is joint work with Nancy Hingston and Alexandru Wanscher. And it is about uh, two questions, in fact. One is a question of what is Poincaré duality, what could it possibly mean in the context of loop spaces? And the second one is about algebraic structures on the homology of loop spaces. In particular, we're interested in bi-algebra structures, structures involving both a product and a co-product. Now, in this talk, I, I've decided not to say so much about the question of Poincaré duality, but rather about the question of, of what bi-algebra structures are we expecting to see? Because this is where we recently understood uh, something more. So, so I, I feel I have something new to add to previous versions of this talk, which I've given over the last year or so. And the plan is roughly first talking about string topology, then about uh, something called symplectic homology, and then about a variant of symplectic homology called rabinowitz fleur homology. All right, so, so let's start with string topology. Uh, throughout this talk, M is uh, a closed uh, manifold of dimension N, and for simplicity, I want to assume it's oriented. It's not necessary if you consistently work with local coefficient systems, but then various statements would have to be slightly modified, and I don't want to get into that. Um, so the circle S1, I will usually write as R mod Z, so maps from the circle are just one periodic maps, and then we define the loop space, which I will always call lambda of M as um, all the smooth maps from the circle to M. And inside of that, that will also play a role throughout this talk is the space of constant loops, which I will denote by lambda zero. Yeah, it's just a copy of M sitting in the loop space. And then that's probably something most of you will have heard. Uh, Chas and Sullivan in their 99 paper described various operations on, the, on homology of uh, loop spaces of manifolds. And uh, one operation which will, end, which will play a role is the loop product. I will denote it by mu. Uh, it's an operation of degree minus n, and this is a schematic picture. So you should think of it as follows. We, it is uh, taking uh, two chains of loops, uh, or rather cycles in the loop space, but I'm thinking of them as chains of loops. Uh, so this is one chain of loops. This is another chain of loops. Now those loops are parametrized, so they have uh, some time zero and we can evaluate both loops at time zero. And then we look in the product of the domains of those two chains. We look at the locus where the evaluations at time zero coincide. That gives us, if the two chains are transverse, it gives us a sub manifold in the product of the domains of co-dimension N. And, uh, and over that sub manifold, now the evaluations at time zero coincide. So I can cut, we can concatenate the two loops. So we can, uh, first go around the first, then around the second loop. No? And that gives us a, a chain again in loop space. And if the two original chains were cycles, then we get a cycle and it represents a homology class in loop space. That is the loop product. Now, uh, Sullivan in 2004 already described also a, a 
co-product version of this one. Uh, and this was later studied uh, in a lot more uh, detail and with applications to closed geodesics by Goreski and Hingston. Uh, and the definition is, is pretty much dual to it. So, so we, now we start with one chain of loops and uh, we look at the evaluation at time zero and the evaluation at time S where S varies through the interval zero one. And then we look at the, the subdomain where those two evaluations coincide. And when the evaluations coincide, then we can decompose the loop into two loops. Namely, first we go from time zero to time S, that is a loop because the evaluations agree. And then we go from time S to time zero. So we get, uh, if we restrict to this uh, subdomain, we get a chain again into now a product of Lambda with itself. And then using Kynet formula, this gives us uh, some operation which lands in the tensor product of the homologies. Now, I've already uh, written it in a, in a correct way by modding out the constant loops. And this will play an important role throughout this talk, what is happening with the constant loops. Why do we want to, or why do we need to mod out the constant loops here, which we didn't have to do for the, for the loop product? Um, we, it is because when S tends to zero or one, say let S tend to zero, then at S equals zero, of course the evaluation at zero and S always coincides. And, and what we see here is that when we decompose, we have a constant loop and the original loop. And, and the same thing happens at S equals one. So at S equals zero and S equals one, we have a degenerate situation which uh, is strictly speaking in our domain. And, uh, and this uh, gives us additional boundary terms which prevent this operation from descending to homology. But if we mod out the con all the constant loops, then, uh, then these boundary terms are just thrown away and we do get a well-defined uh, operation on homology. Yeah, so. Okay, so uh, by the way, the, the degree of this, op of this co-product is one minus N because we added one additional parameter S varying over the interval and then we impose a co-dimension N condition. Yeah, so it's an operation of degree one minus N. Now, Hi, can I yes, make a yes, qu uh, question uh, and comment uh, in your previous slide? So mm -hmm. uh, you said this is sort of dual uh, to the Chas Sullivan loop product, right? Well, we're going um, to see how, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, right. But I was going just to mention that, that you could also have thought as fixing a parameter, uh, yes. right? Like your favorite parameter, one half. Yes. And now doing the same construction. Uh, yes. Of course, we know that this is sort of trivial in some sense, but that operation could also be thought of as dual in some Indeed. sense. Yes. To the loop thank, thank you. Yes. Yes. Th th yeah. yeah. Th thanks for this com comment. Indeed. I yeah. You could do that. You could fix some value of s, like s equals to one half. That gives you an operation. That is more naively what you would consider maybe the dual operation. Indeed. And uh, uh, and and we'll actually see this in in a context of symplectic homology come back. And uh, but this operation, as you will say. Uh, is rather trivial and it only uh, lives on the constant uh, loops. Uh, so, and, and really, really only on the point class. Um, and, and therefore that, is, that operation is not so interesting. And you can think of this operation, which I wrote as a secondary operation, uh, which is arising because the primary operation that you said uh, is essentially trivial. Yeah, so, so this is how, how, how one can think of it. And this point of view will come back later in the context of symplectic homology. All right, now, now what are the relations between those two operations? And, and Sullivan quite uh, mysteriously wrote in his paper that they should, is, should satisfy the following uh, relation. And uh, for lack of a better name, we called it a Sullivan's relation. Well, I think it's just because we talked about it so much. Yeah? And uh, so, so, he, uh, so if you take the composition lambda mu, uh, it should be equal to these other two compositions on the right-hand side. And how, how you think of it uh, heuristically, it makes sense. So 
On the left-hand side, we first apply mu. So we take two chains of loops. We apply mu, which means we we look at the locus where the evaluations coincide, and then we uh, concatenate. And then we apply lambda to it. Now, so for this concatenation of two loops, we need to look at self intersections at times s where the evaluation at s agrees with the one at zero. So, so these self intersections could appear on the first or on the second loop. So, so we could have a value of s on the first loop where the evaluation agrees with the one at time zero. And if we decompose here, what we'll see is that we have a first loop like this, and then a second loop, which is this one, and then followed by the other one. And, uh, but it could also appear on the second uh, loop, so we have it here, and then we first go around the first loop, around the second loop until this time s. This would be one loop in the output, and then go around like this. And if you look at those two pictures on the right hand side, you see they correspond to these operations. You can think of them as first applying lambda here, the coproduct, and then the product, or it applying lambda in the second factor, and then the product. Yeah, and those are precisely the two terms on the right hand side. So, so on, on the level of pictures, this, this makes perfect sense and you expect this relation. Uh, I've also added some other algebraic conditions that mu is associative and commutative that we know, uh, and lambda is co-associative and co-commutative. That's also expected. Now, the problem is uh, this last relation, this Sullivan's relation is on, on which space should this even hold? Because as I emphasized, mu and lambda are defined on different spaces. Mu is defined on the whole homology of loop space, and lambda is only defined on the homology module, mod the constant loops. Now, and I explained that you cannot directly define lambda if you do not mod out the constant loops. You have a problem there. Yes. Well, you could think, okay, let's do the converse. Let's just uh, descend mu to the quotient by the constant loops. And, I'm uh, and I want to show you that this is also not always possible. So mu in general does not descend to the quotient by the constant loops. What does it mean for it to descend? It would mean that the, 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 the constant loops should be uh, an ideal for mu. Then you can mod it out and you get a, get a product on the quotient. Uh, now here's, here's a very concrete example. Let's take for the manifold M the n-dimensional torus. Um, and I take as one chain, I take a zero chain consisting of a constant loop, which is just sitting at one point. Here it is, Q0. And then I take an N chain, which is parameterized by the torus itself. And it's an N chain of non-constant loops. Namely, I always take the straight lines in the X1 direction. So, uh, so let's say here's, here's the X1 direction. So I choose any initial point on the torus, and then I go once around in the S1, in the X1 direction. That is an end chain. Okay, and now I want to compute the loop product of those two. Uh, so mu of Q0 comma A, it, we need to look at where the two initial points at, at time zero, uh, their evaluations coincide. And, uh, and that is happening precisely for one uh, loop in this, chain of loops here from the torus, namely where the initial point is precisely at the point Q0, right? So, so the output is a, a one rigid loop starting at Q0 and going once around in the X1 action. So, so I get a zero chain, uh, but which is in, in a non-constant loop, right? So what, I'm, what I have is I have a product of, of a class in constant loops with another class and the output is not in the constant loop. So this shows that the constant loops do not form an ideal. So for this manifold, the n-dimensional torus, the, the loop product will not descend to the quotient by the constants. Okay. So, so this also doesn't work. And then you wonder, like, is there a common space on which you can define both operations? And this is the first result that I want to explain in, that indeed there is. So both operations uh, can be naturally defined on what we call reduced loop space homology. This is not usual reduced homology, it's a step variant of it. Namely, we mod out from the homology of loop space, the homology of a point multiplied by the Euler characteristic of the manifold. 
Okay, so, so, so rather than modding out a point, we take Euler characteristic times a point and, um, and mod out that one. And, uh, and moreover, uh, we, can, we can define both operations there in such a way that they do satisfy Sullivan's relation. Okay, so how, how does this work? And how does the Euler characteristic of the manifold naturally come into play? So let's uh, write out in some more detail the definition of this co-product. Uh, so we take a chain in loop space, who ultimately wants to be a cycle, yeah, with some domain k sub a, and then we define a new domain, which is the space of x comma s, x is a parameter value and s time between zero and one, such that the evaluation at time s agrees with the evaluation at time zero. Okay. And, and then over that locus, we want to define the, the new loop, the new chain of loops on this domain into lambda times lambda by uh, decomposing. We restrict the loop to the interval zero to s, or to the interval from S to one. Okay. That is the original definition, but that definition is degenerate at S equals zero and S equals one. So this is not a good definition. This is not transversely cut out. Okay, so how can we remedy this? And uh, it's kind of uh, the obvious thing to do. We just want to make it transverse, so we perturb it. And the natural way to perturb it, let's pick a small vector field V on the manifold with non-degenerate zeros, denote its flow by ft and the time one map of the flow by f. And then uh, for every point q in the manifold, we have a, a, a path from q to f of q, just following uh, the ft of q. So here's this path from q to f of q, and we can go backwards. So I, let's denote this path by pi q and pi and uh, and it's inverse, pi q inverse, the, the path going the opposite way. And now we're going to modify our definition of the domain for the loop coproduct, namely, rather than saying the evaluation at time s equals the evaluation at time zero, we say it equals the evaluation at time zero applied f to it. Yeah, and, and this, uh, you can check if the vector field had non-degenerate zeros, this uh, becomes transversely cut out at zero and one. And, and now over that locus, now the evaluations do not quite coincide. So at time zero and at time S, they don't agree, but they're related by F. So I cannot just restrict to zero S and have a loop, but I can naturally close up this restriction to time zero as I close up by going backward this path, which I mentioned before. And then, then I'm going forward this path and go around the rest. So, so I naturally get two loops out of, out of my data. Yeah, so, so, so this is written in formulas. I, I restrict to the interval zero s and I close up by this canonical path and the other way. So I do get a map from this new domain into the product of loop spaces. And now everything is transversely cut out and uh, this actually defines an operation. And now Can let's- Can I ask a question? Yes, Simon? go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Is it possible to achieve transversality in the open interval in such a way such that when you take the closure, you get a nice geometric object? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This- Is this I mean, exactly what you're saying? Maybe? That's exactly what I'm saying, yes. Okay, good, yeah. Yes. That's exactly what I'm saying. So, so, so with this, with this condition, uh, you you achieve transversality over the open interval, which, which in fact is transversality over the closed interval all the way up to the boundary. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. So this is a yeah. Okay. Good. I see. Yeah. So this is the best possible situation that you get. And, I mean, you you also need to perturb the chains of of, of loops uh, slightly. Yeah. So because to to have transversality in the interior. Yeah. This F is taking care of what's happening at the boundary points, S equals zero, S equals one. You still need to perturb in the interior to make it transverse. But then let, let's work out what is the condition at S equals zero, say. The condition is that uh, at S equals zero should be that the evaluation at zero should be 
the same as the evaluation at zero with the map F applied, which means that the evaluation at zero must be in the fixed point set of F, which is just the zero set of the vector field, the set of zeros of the vector field. Yeah. So, so which means at S and S equals zero and S equals one, I just get, uh, get finitely many points as, as the contributions. Yeah, there's only finitely many points which can appear, which are precisely the zeros of the vector field. And now I can choose the zeros of the vector field to all lie in a small neighborhood of uh, some base point Q0. And uh, so, so that I identify the constant loops at those points, I, I at, on the level of homology, I can canonically connect them to Q0 and view them as just being Q0 itself. And then each of those points gives us a contribution at S equals zero and S equals one. Now, if you work out more precisely how the, this is, uh, you take the pre-image of the evaluation map that induces some orientations, then each of those zeros of the vector field gives us a contribution, which is precisely the index of the vector field at that non-degenerate zero. So in the output, you sum over all the zeros of the vector field, the indices, so the left hand, so this just gives the Euler characteristic. And then you get uh, a contribution, this one times Q0 as the first output loop and the original loop as the second output loop. This is what, what you get at S equals zero. And at S equals one, you get a similar thing. So, so the output lands precisely in, in the locus where one of the two loops is Euler characteristic times Q0, times the base point. Yeah, so, so if I mod out Euler characteristic times the base point, then the two boundary terms vanish and, and it descends. Okay, so, so this is somehow, this shows what is the minimal thing that we need to mod out to, to have this coproduct well-defined. Yeah, so it's precisely Euler characteristic times the base point. And now could it turns you, out. Yes. Uh, could you explain it again? How uh, the index um, of the um, zero of the, the vector, vector field uh, comes in? Yes. Is uh, related to the constant loops here with this calculation? Yes. So, so it is. It, it's uh, it's related to the question of how you orient uh, the domain. So so the domains should be. The the original domain is something like a simplex with its canonical orientation. Then you you take uh, this condition and this cuts out some subdomain. Now that subdomain should inherit some orientation. So you should write this condition by saying it's some kind of evaluation map You take the pre-image of the diagonal under this evaluation map. And then by looking at the linearization at the derivative of this evaluation map and pulling back the, the, the normal of the diagonal tells you what the orientation is on this new domain. Yeah, because I want to get an orientation on this new domain. And when you work this out, then you will see that uh, if you take the derivative of this evaluation map, you get the derivative of F come into play and, uh, and uh, then you get the uh, determinant of the derivative of F come into play. And that precisely gives you the index of the zeros of the vector field. Yeah, so it comes, comes from considering the orientation, the induced orientation. I see. Yeah. I, and, and, I hadn't mentioned that before, but of course you need to talk about orientations uh, to represent homology classes again. And when you say uh, Ka is is cut out transversely, are you thinking of it as a subspace of uh, loop space times itself? And um, no, what I say is trans is cut out transversely. Is this K lambda of A? This one. Yes. yes, and when you said that, 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 not... that, that is a subspace in Ka times the interval zero one. So, so Ka is a simplex, oh. and you take Ka times zero one. This is a manifold with corners, not quite a simplex. And in that, in that manifold with corners, we have a, a sub manifold, which is actually a sub manifold with corners, uh, which is transversely cut out. And these are infinite dimensional. No, no, no. Those are finite dimensional. Yes. So, so the Ka was was uh, the simplex uh, for my for my chain in the loop space that I start with. So oh, you, you oh, pull okay. back. So, you so pull this back is, to the oh. yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Okay. all this is not taking place in the loop, so it's just taking place on the domain. I see, I see, okay. Yeah. But I think you could have uh, said something at the loop space level, right? I could have. And then yes. you would be proving that something has finite co-dimension or yes. something along yes. these lines. Yes, yes, all, all these things, I'm, I'm following the original description of this string topology operation as they were written in Charles and Sullivan. Now they have later been reformulated by working directly on the loop space level and, and uh, exhibiting some sub-manifolds of finite co-dimension in loop space and uh, proving they have normal bundles and so on. So you could do everything in the loop space, work in this infinite dimensional setting, yes. Right. But but okay. since uh, since I only want to get these things on homology, I found it's enough to just work directly so, with. Uh, so Kai, I think uh, there might be a subtlety here. Uh, you need to set up a uh, kind of geometric homology theory with manifolds with corners mm, and so on. Well, I I don't really because I only uh -huh. want to. I I'm, I don't want to get these things on chain level. If I wanted to have okay. stuff on chain level, that's what I would run into, and and uh, I I've wasted quite some time with it because it's actually subtle. But uh, but here I just want to get operations on homology. So so the only thing I want to say is the following: I start with a cycle in loop space. I represent it by a map from a simple complex. Now I produce something, I produce this manifold with corners here. And, and it has some boundary terms, but uh, they land in Euler characteristic times constant. So, so they are modded out. And now I triangulate this thing, this manifold with corners. And then it, it again represents a singular homology class. And I take that class. And that is can my you definition. Always, on can you always do that? Triangulate them yeah, with yeah, you can, which is also slightly <laughs> subtle, but it is uh, it is doable. Yes, okay. right. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. There, there, there is in, in, indeed some subtleties related to manifold with corners in, in, involved in here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but I think that's the only thing we need that you can triangulate manifold with corners, and you can also triangulate them rel boundary. So, so if you have already a triangulation on the boundary, you can extend it to a triangulation in the interior. I think that's probably what we need at some place. Yeah. But, uh, but that's the only thing. And then we get something on, on the level of homology. Now it a priori depends on some choices and then you prove it doesn't depend on choices. And uh, so, so for, to get things on homology, this is good enough. Yeah. All right. Um, now, so, so this shows that lambda can be defined when we mod out Euler characteristic times the constants. And now the, the wonderful thing is that you can also prove that the, the loop product in fact descends to that quotient where you mod out Euler characteristic times the constants. Yeah? So, so it also descends and then you have both of them on the same space. Yeah? So, so by, for example, my previous counter example of the torus where the loop product did not descend if you mod out the constants, it does descend when you mod out Euler characteristic times the constant because it was a torus, it has Euler characteristic zero. Yeah, so, so there, there you don't have any problem. Okay, so, so I, there, yeah. there's something uh, I think I missed. So mm -hmm. when you mod out by the constant loops, yes, I think you're killing the unit of the loop product, right? Um, so, so you're killing the algebra. No, in some no, sense. no. Yeah, well, well. If if you mod out by all the constant loops, yes. All but, the constant loops. But but that's what I said. The the product would not descend to that. That's another exactly. way of seeing it. Maybe yeah, that it can't. I see. Descend. But now you're not modding by. You're not killing the unit. We're not killing the unit. We mod out something times the point class. The unit is I not see. the point class. The unit is the fundamental class. The fundamental class. I see. Yes. I see. So we're not throwing that away. Yes. Yeah. So, and another so, comment, so the product yeah. still has its unit. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Another yeah. comment. Uh, you, you, you can ignore this if you're short on time, but um, I know you can also lift the uh, co product to the uh, ordinary homology by adding certain terms. Yes. Right. Um, Is yeah. that compa uh, infinitesimally compatible with the loop product at that level or not? I think it's not. So, so, so you. Okay. I, th I think you refer to, I think in Goreski-Hinks in some way, they extend it to, to the 
to the whole homology, right? The, this right. this co-product, and but I think they basically extend it by zero. So so they just okay. uh, yeah. they have it mod the constants, and then they extend it by setting it to zero whenever anything involves constants. And uh, uh, and this will not be compatible. It will not, with the pr product. So they, they will not satisfy Sullivan's relation. They actually, was about the hardest part, some of the hardest parts of this project was convincing Nancy Hinkson that Sullivan's relation can possibly hold. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, because because uh, the way they define it, it doesn't hold. And she, she uh, was very right. hard to convince that we can make it work. Um, but I, I claim if you do it the way I described, it actually then works. You know, but but I think this is pre pretty much the unique way of doing it. Yeah, I mean you, as you see from the proof, you uh, you have to mod out at least Euler characteristic times the point class in order to have the the uh, co-product well defined. And I think from the other side, uh, you cannot mod out more than that because then the product will not descend. And uh, this is pretty much the this, this is the unique choice you have. And with that choice, actually, you can make Sullivan's relation work. So here's an example which has been worked out in the literature by Cohen, Jones, and Yen. They computed the loop uh, product on, they computed it on the loop spaces of all spheres. So let's take, for example, the three dimensional sphere to be very concrete. And uh, you want to shift degrees by, uh, by three, uh, or actually by minus three so that the product becomes some, an operation of degree zero, then the algebra becomes nicer to write down. And uh, then you have the, the point class, which, which now has degree minus three after shifting, and you have some other class, uh, which is, and those two classes generate the loop space. This you compute from minimal models. And, uh, and then they also, and, and this is true, now as a ring with the loop product, as a ring with the loop product, uh, the homology of the loop space of S3 looks like this. Uh, it's a polynomial ring, on, and, well, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's an exterior algebra by two generators, one of odd degree, one of even degree. And uh, now you can also work out the co-product using the recipe that I gave you, you can actually work it out. Uh, you'd have explicit uh, representatives for those classes and you work out the co-product that you get some formulas <coughs> and you check that those formulas satisfy everything you want. <coughs> okay, I don't want to go into, into that. Now, now, let me give you a more interesting example, which is S1, and that uh, caused me a lot of headache. Um, so uh, for S1, you can also write the homology of loop space. Now this is has two series of generators. So k, an integer, will always denote the winding number of a loop around the circle. So, and then you can either have a rigid loop just as a zero-dimensional class, which is winding k times around. Those are will denote by a k, or you have. Uh, uh, one parametric family of loops go winding around k times where the base point is moving once around the circle. This, yeah, so, so the a k have degree, unshifted degrees, uh, zero and the b k have degree one where the base point is also moving once around the circle. Here's actually formulas if you uh, like seeing formulas for those. Yeah, it's easy to write down what they are. And, uh, <clears throat> and now, the loop product here has geometric degree. If, so I'm not shifting here for the time being. So geometric degree minus one, and you can write it down. So the, the, the A classes have product zero, and then the AK times BL is AK plus L. It's, it's clear that the winding numbers have to add up. Yeah, so K and L winding number needs to give us product of winding number K plus L. Uh, and and the B classes satisfy this, so so you can write out, write it out. Uh, okay, now now let's look at the co-product. So that product had also been also been worked out by uh, by Cohen and co-authors. Yeah, but it's easy to do by hand. Now the co-product we can also do by hand in this case. So according to our recipe, we need to perturb by a vector field on on the circle. And here, since 
the character is zero, it's nice if I perturb by a vector field which has no zeros at all. So I don't have to worry about boundary terms and don't, and don't have to mod out anything. Yeah. So, but now there's two choices. I mean, I can have my vector field either pointing in the positive orientation of the circle or in the negative orientation of the circle. So, uh, and up to homotopy, there, there's, there's two different no vanishing vector fields on the circle. Let me call them V plus or minus. Yeah, just, just something small of length epsilon pointing in the positive or in the negative direction. And then the corresponding flow will just shift a point X by plus or minus epsilon. Okay, and then with that recipe, you work out uh, the coproducts. And uh, here's the formula, so, so don't worry about the uh, precise formulas. I just want to point out uh, one thing here, which I circled in red, is if I compute the coproduct with respect to the vector field V plus, I get some expression. And if I compute it with respect to the vector field V minus, I get another expression. And uh, if you stare, for example, at the first line here, you see that here the sun runs from 0 to k minus 1, here from 1 to k. Uh, so some of the boundary terms are treated differently. So uh, if you use one vector field, then you will push away the boundary contribution at s equals 0, but not the one at s equals 1. And if you do the other one, you do it the opposite way. So those sums will differ. So the definition of the coproduct on the level of homology actually depends on the choice of this vector field. There was an unpleasant surprise because we had somehow hoped that this would be canonical and would not depend on any choices. Um, but there, there was more unpleasant surprises to come. Uh, namely, then uh, when, I, when I had uh, some time at my, on my hands, uh, and I, I, I just for the fun of it, I thought I'd maybe also check all the other relations. It worked, and it turns out that if I choose either V plus or V minus, then Sullivan's relation holds, but the coproduct will not be co commutative and it will not be co associative, which are also some things that we expect to be true. So, uh, so the theorem that I stated before is, is true, uh, but still it's, it's not as we would like it to be. Yeah. So we, can, get, can define lambda and mu on the same space so that Sullivan's relation holds, but uh, we may not have co-commutativity and co-associativity for the co-product. Uh, and uh, and I, I, I don't know whether for the circle it is possible to somehow fiddle around and come up with some definition which satisfies all the relations. I, I tried to play around, I didn't find one. Yeah, so it seems that we have a problem here. And this, this is where we get stuck uh, by just doing things purely in string topology. Now, this is maybe some kind of cut in this talk. So now I will move to symplectic geometry. Are there any questions up to this point? I have a question. Is this uh, non co commutativity and non co associativity um, kind of? Um, does it have to do with non simply connectedness of the circle? In some mm -hmm. sense, yes, it does. It does. I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Good. So, so I I think, but I have not worked out all the details. So, which I'm which why I'm slightly cautious is that if the manifold is simply connected, will not depend on the choice of vector fields. Now, there's some other choices involved if you actually want to make it rigorous, which still might matter. But I think if the manifold is too connected and of dimension high enough, like dimension at least five or six, I, then I think it will not depend on any choice, it will be completely canonical and probably also satisfy all the relations. So, so yes, this is a consequence of this being non-simply connected. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so now let's switch uh, perspective and go to symplectic geometry. Um, and I will talk about uh, uh, symplectic geometry without defining anything. So you should really just look at pictures because uh, there's no way I'm, I'm defining it in the, in the time that I have. Yeah, so, so in symplectic geometry, we, we have some theory called Fleur homology, uh, which is uh, 
mounting periodic orbits of some Hamiltonian system on a symplectic manifold uh, uh, with a boundary operator, which is counting cylinders connecting those, satisfying suitable equation. Now, this Fleur homology is also known to have operations on it by looking not just at cylinders, which give you the boundary operator, but looking at arbitrary surfaces, arbitrary Riemann surfaces. And here's a picture of a Riemann surface. So such a Riemann surface, and we have a Riemann surface with cylindrical ends. Some of them we, we term, we name positive, some of them we name negative, and that will give us an operation on Fleur homology. Now, what I call symplectic homology is really a direct limit of some Fleur homologies for Hamiltonians, which uh, at infinity are increasing of some slope and you let the slope go to infinity. This is all I want to say about that. The, the one thing that I want to retain from this is to get operations on Fleur homology, you have to pit, pick some weights at the inputs and at the outputs, and they need to satisfy some condition that the sum of weights at the output must be greater equal to the sum of weights at the input. This is the one thing that will maybe play a role in the sequel. All right. So let me not go into any more detail, but but oh, but this condition on the weights tells us that we need to have at least one output because the sum of the weights at the output must be bigger than those at the inputs. Yeah. So we can only define operations which have at least one output. And that's what I want to take away from this. Just, just looking at the equations we need to solve, we need this condition which is why on Fleur homology, we do not in general get a full TQFT structure, but only what people would call a non-compact TQFT structure of operations, which have at least one output. Now, here's the simplest of those operations, which are relevant for us. We can take a pair of pens with two inputs and one output, and that will define a product, which I will suggest suggestively name mu SH like symplectic homology. And that is an operation of degree minus N, which will correspond to the loop product. And then you can do an inverted pair of pens with one input and two outputs. And that defines you a, a one to two option, some kind of co-product. And if you do it naively, then you do exactly what Manuel was mentioning earlier. Then you get an operation which is roughly trivial. To get an interesting one, you build a secondary operation out of that, where you do it over a one parameter family where you degenerate this pair of this inverted pair of pens in two different ways. And this is schematically shown here. You're looking at pair of pens with one input and two outputs, but then you degenerate it by either splitting off a cylinder at the first output or splitting off a cylinder at the second output. Now, both of those guys will, will vanish when you mod out some constants. Uh, and this interpolation gives you uh, then the secondary operation. And that way we get an operation of degree one minus n, which will correspond to the loop co-product. And, and this is uh, true in the following sense. If as the simplex manifold, I take the unit disk cotangent bundle. So the cotangent bundle uh, and unit disk bundle, or you can complete it to the whole cotangent bundle. Uh, and you apply this construction, this symplectic homology to the cotangent bundle, you precisely get the homology of the loop space. That is an old theorem of Viterbo. And, uh, and then here, this is, uh, okay, yes. So on the left-hand side, yeah, okay, that's all I wanted to say. No, no, I wanted to need to mention one more thing. We also have a reduced version of symplectic homology where we're mimicking what in loop space side was modding out Euler characteristic times the point class. Here, it is related to some Fleur continuation map, which we mod out, and then we call that the reduced homology. And then on that reduced, sorry, on that reduced symplectic homology, those operations become well defined counting pair of pants and inverted pair of pants. They satisfy Sullivan's relation and the isomorphism to the reduced homology of loop space precisely intertwines those two operations with the product and co-product on loop space that we discussed before. So, so we can translate the whole picture to symplectic terms by applying it to a cotangent bundle. That's the only thing I wanted to take away from uh, these few slides.
but we have not resolved our problem because if we apply it to the base manifold S1, then I mean, we have just reformulated what we've seen on the loop space in symplectic terms. It still has this deficiency that the co-product on symplectic homology will not be co-commutative and co-associative. Yeah? So we have not fixed that. But now on the symplectic side, we have some variation of symplectic homology, which, we, which is the main player in this whole project. And I, that's why I definitely wanted to get to at least mention that. So there's a version of Fleur homology, which is called Rabinovitz Fleur homology. That has a kind of long history. It had been introduced in a quite different manner, but then it was realized that it actually relates very nicely to symplectic homology. And this is, uh, in simple, I had briefly shown before for symplectic homology, you take Fleur homologies of some Hamiltonians, which are constant in the interior, they go, linearly to infinity at infinity. Now we can instead take Hamiltonians which are V-shaped like this. They start up being very large, then near the boundary of our domain, they go down and then they go up again. And uh, you can also define Fleur homology for these ones. And then you let both slopes, this slope and this slope go to infinity and take some direct limit. And this is giving you some different version of Fleur homology which nicely fits into a long exact sequence. So this we call Rabinowitz Fleur homology. And it also depends on V, but we suggestively write it as, an, as something related to the boundary because uh, really the, all the uh, interesting thing happens near the boundary. And uh, then there's a long exact sequence relating this to symplectic homology and to symplectic cohomology. There's also symplectic cohomology obtained by dualizing symplectic homology. Okay, so, so which means if we do this for a cotangent bundle, then we get a long exact sequence where here we will have loop space homology. Here we will have loop space cohomology. And here we will have a third player which fits into a long exact sequence with those two. Okay. Now, now this is something which I have not seen directly in topological terms, yes, because this, also note, for example, there's a, there's a degree shift. The symplectic, or let's say the loop space cohomology is completely shifted into negative degrees. And the, whereas the homology lives in positive degrees. So this group here will have contributions in arbitrarily positive and negative degrees. So it's definitely not a homology of a space. Yeah, it is something which naturally comes up in the context of Fleur homologies. Um, but it, is, it does not have an interpretation as a homology of a space. It does have an interpretation of the homology of the spectrum, but I don't want to go into that. Um, so, so then, uh, uh, if we- Hi, if, can, you can, yeah. can you construct, um, I guess you can construct an explicit uh, unbounded chain complex yes. calculating this. Yes. I mean, we can construct this in many different ways. One would be as a homology of a spectrum, which we have not carried out yet, but I know it can be done. The, the thing that we have carried out is we write an explicit chain complex. And it's really a, a join of the two ch chain complexes for, so you take the singular chain complex on the loop space, you take the singular co-chain complex on the loop space and shift it into negative degrees. So it's also becoming a chain complex. Mm -hmm. And then, but then there, there's in fact some interaction term. And, and this interaction term, we can just write it explicitly. And, and it's something right. relatively trivial. It's just multiplying some point class by Euler characteristic. Uh, right. and, uh, and then you can check it's a chain complex and the homology of that chain complex is the correct thing. Right, so that's, yeah. I just wanted to say that that's exactly the picture we get in the Hochschild setup, right? Mm -hmm. We work out, for for Abenius algebra, have Hochschild chains, Hochschild co-chains, and then you connect them using the Frobenius structure, which is essentially modeling multiplication by the Euler characteristic. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yes. And then yeah. it's kind of it's kind of surprising. I mean, not, it's a trivial computation, but it's a kind of surprising that it's square zero. You know, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it to, is. It is. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, anyway. right. Yeah, 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 you get this chain and you have you put something in between which is not zero and, and still you get the chain which uh, squares to zero. It's kind of surprising when you, yeah. 
when you first see it. Yes, yeah. This is also related to the Tate construction. Basically. Yes. Um, so it's another way of of maybe viewing this is uh, some Tate construction you're doing. Um, right. So so we get this new player, uh, and now what I want to claim uh, in the end is that on this new player now everything falls into place and everything becomes uh, perfect. So here's uh, here's the the last uh, theorem that I wanted to mention today is now you take Rabinowitz Fleur homology, you also shift it by degrees by n to put the product in degree zero. So so this also carries a product and a co-product. And we do not mod need to mod out anything. So here the co-product is defined just on the nose. Yeah, so so nothing, no necessar necessity to mod out anything. Okay, that's the first nice thing. So the it's and the product and co-product are also defined by this pair of pens, product and secondary pair of pens co-product, but somehow miraculously the boundary terms that we always said to worry about, they just disappear. And I will show you a slide schematically why this happens. They just go away and it's defined on the nose. And also the structure here, we can show the structure is independent of all choices. It also depends on some choices to define this, uh, uh, but does, it's independent of all choices. Even in, this, in the non-simply connected case, in any case, it's independent of all choices. Then, uh, those two operations, they do satisfy all the all the operations of an infinitesimal bialgebra. So they are so the product is associative and commutative, the co-product is co-associative, co-commutative, and they satisfy Sullivan's relation. So all the relations hold here on the nose. Moreover, and that is something which we only recently discovered, there is another relation which had not appeared uh, so far in the string topology literature. Well, actually, okay, kind of had, but uh, uh, we we never had seen it before. Uh, so, so mu and lambda, in fact, satisfy an additional relation. I will also show you a picture of this uh, relation. For for lack of better name, we currently call it four-term relation. But, uh, um, yeah. All right. And Moreover, you can go to Rabinowitz Fleur cohomology. You just dualize the whole construction. Then the pro the, the co-product on homology will just algebraically give you a co-product. Uh, sorry, the co-product on homology will give you a product on cohomology. So I will just denote that product by lambda v, v being dual. Yeah. Whereas the product on homology gives you a co-product on cohomology, just just algebraically, it's algebraically dual to that. Right. Do, so do you have to com co complete the tensor product or something along these lines? Yes. Yeah, so uh, um, this uh, well, it it first seems like you have to, but ultimately you don't. Um, and that's because you have Poincare duality. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, um, but, uh, um, how to, how to say that? Um, I should, I should rather say it as follows, that uh, what we actually do is to define this lambda V is, we just uh, mimic the construction of lambda by looking at the same inverted pair of pens, but now reading the pair, the same pair of pens with one which had one input and two outputs, so it has one positive and two negative ends. But now we read it from bottom to top. Now we view the the, the two negative ends as inputs and the positive end as output, and, and view this as living on cohomology and just just count these things and define this directly on cohomology. So we're not actually algebraically dualizing. So we're not running into, into difficulties of, uh, of completions, but we're just doing, we're just reading the same operations a different way and defining things on Fleur cohomology directly. Yes, so, so, so when I say it's algebraically, we're not actually algebraically dualizing. We're just uh, 
defining the operations by reading them, by interpreting them differently. Yeah. Um, but those operations then live in cohomology without any completion, just on ordinary Rabinus Fleur cohomology. And moreover, there is a Poincare duality isomorphism now, which is give an isomorphism between Rabinus Fleur homology and Rabinus Fleur cohomology with some degree shift. And it's intertwining the product and co-product here with the product and co-product there. Now that is surprising, yeah, because the product here was our mu. Now the product here came from the co-product, right? By its dual to the co-product, but but those two get get intertwined by this Poincaré duality. So so it's a non-trivial statement here, yeah. It's not, uh, yeah. and uh, so 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 on that level, we we find some beautiful duality that it's has. Uh, it's it's dual to its own cohomology as as a bialgebra with all the operations uh, matching. Yeah? So so this is uh, what what we came to call it's our variant of Poincaré duality for loop spaces. Yeah, I know there's other uh, ways to think about Poincaré duality, trying to define Poincaré duality on chain level of the manifold itself, and and if that can be done, it probably would imply this result here, but this is our variant where we we, we have a nice space, this arena with Fleur homology, on which we see a, a perfect duality matching all the all the operations. Yeah. Okay. So so if I have uh, another minute or so, I will show you just a few pictures how this is proved. Um, so, so first, I promised you there's a schematic presentation of those relations. This is Sullivan's relation. It's taking mu, which we represent by, by we can represent by graph with two inputs and, and one output, just a tree with two inputs and one output. And this is lambda. So this is a composition first mu, then lambda. I always read my pictures from top to bottom. And then these are the other two uh, uh, operations in Sullivan's relation. And then in this schematic pitch, in, in this schematic language, I can also write the four term relation. So it also has two inputs here and it has two outputs. And I labeled them with one and two because we need to remember which is the first input and first and which is the first output out of the two. Yeah, so to get the correct relation. And then it's uh, some, some funny looking uh, relation. That's one thing I wanted to show you. Another thing I wanted to show you is why the uh, why there's no boundary terms, why we don't have to mod out anything when we do, do it on Rabinoid's Fleur homology. Rabinoid's Fleur homology is defined by these V-shaped Hamiltonians. And the boundary terms will come by splitting off at the boundary some continuation map from minus the Hamiltonian to the Hamiltonian. Now, now, when you deform minus the Hamiltonian, which looks like this V-shaped upside down to this V-shaped upward, then you need to do it in a monotone fashion. And you can do it by first moving this upwards. Sorry, no, by first moving this one upwards. Then you go to this Hamiltonian and then to that one. Now, this Hamiltonian in the middle does not have any periodic orbits. So you need to Trust me on that because I didn't explain what these pictures mean, but it does not have anything here. So we're factoring this continuation map through a group which is manifestly zero. And, and this is something which happens for this V-shaped Hamiltonian, which does not happen for the other Hamiltonians for symplectic homology. So this is something miraculous on Rabinowitz Fleur homology that these boundary terms are just zero on the nose. And finally, here's a, a a proof of Sullivan's relation. And uh, the, the picture, so this is look proved by looking at a two parametric family of, uh, of uh, Riemann surfaces, which are spheres with two positive uh, cylindrical ends and two negative cylindrical ends. This is just a schematic picture. And then this, these are degenerated in all kinds of possible ways. And there's a hexagon of possible degenerations uh, that you find. And some of the sites are zero. 
and the other sites uh, are the the composition of operations that we want to see yeah and it makes sense that we need to see uh, one dimensional sites here because the lambda is obtained by one parametric uh, version it's a secondary operation with one parameter that's why we expect to see one dimensional sites here yes so and then the the four term relation is very similar just different pictures it's also governed by some hexagon reading of things on the side but now here on two sides we get zero and on four sides we get non-zero terms so it's uh, working out slightly differently and the last thing i wanted to show the last picture is to prove co-associativity for lambda now lambda is a one parametric operation so if you take a composition of lambda with itself for co-associativity you already have two parametric uh, operation and to see a relation you need to go to dimension three and then Alex uh, Wansha came up with with this beautiful picture that he called the house for obvious reasons yeah so it's a three-dimensional polyhedron with boundary boundary sites and so on written and then on some of the boundary faces you get zeros and some other and so, some others you read off the co-associativity relation but it's really complicated yeah so so this is where we were and we we proved all that and we we proved the theorem that's all that is written and then recently uh, a student of alex wancher uh thibault uh oh, i forgot his last name uh i think i wrote it here uh thibault mazuir uh he was at a conference and he sat in a talk by kate poirier and kate poirier gave a talk and she started drawing exactly those guys those those pictures like she, she drew literally this picture here of and, and she, she drew hexagons but hexagons we, we're seeing all over the place in in algebraic topology but but this one is kind of not so obvious and she drew exactly those pictures in a talk about joint work with thomas stradler uh, of, of some some hierarchy of polyhedra governing some algebraic infinity structure uh, that they call a I, I can't pronounce his name, Aso Koipahedra, yeah. Um, and uh, and it's, after looking at that, it seems fairly clear that what we are seeing here is the beginning of an infinity structure, uh, which we sh then should be seeing on chain level, on the Arduino with Fleur chain complex. And this is what uh, Thibault Mazuir is, is uh, doing for his PhD. He's trying to work this out and define this infinity this infinity structure associated to this asocoipahedra and uh, and showing that Rabino's Fleur homology really carries this kind of structure so that the bi-algebra structure is uh, is what we is the induced structure on homology of that one and with this I want to finish thank you very much great thanks for the talk let's thank hi virtually <laughs> any question yeah, I, I, well, I have like an hour of comments in my head, so <laughs> and questions. So, um, let me, yeah, about this last point, um, I wanted to discuss a little bit. So, yeah, this is interesting. So, yeah, so this infinitesimal by algebra uh, structure, um, and I, I actually learned this from uh, your paper with um, one of your papers with with Nancy and Alex. In, in the Rabinovitz flower uh, homology, this follows as a consequence of associativity <laughs> of certain um, products. Um, right? No. It is. No? Uh, uh. Okay. So, so, so that's, uh, it's actually, actually very intricate picture. So, so let me go back. Uh, to one formula that I had for Rabinovitz homology. So, so if you so Rabinovitz Fleur homology fits into this long exact sequence with symplectic homology and cohomology. So let's do it for the loop space case for the unit cotangent bundle. Then, then it fits into a long exact sequence. But if you take, if you pass to reduced homology, you, you make this long exact sequence a short exact sequence. You, from here, 
you replace the left hand side by the co-kernel of this continuation map by the, the right hand side by the kernel and that means precisely you pass to reduced homologies so mm -hmm. uh, so you get a short exact sequence which non-canonically splits uh, uh, so you can view Rabino's Fleur homology as a direct sum of reduced loop space homology and its reduced loop space cohomology. Now, now on Rabino's Fleur homology, we have a product and which is associative. Now it right. turns out the product which restricts to the loop product here and it is extremely surprising. It also restricts here and it restricts here to a product which is, which is the dual of the goretzky higgson co-product, of the loop co-product, yeah. right? So, and then uh, the associativity of the product which we have on Rabinowitz Fleur gives you some relation between these restrictions. And that is precisely Sullivan's relation. So, so that is Sullivan's relation on reduced loop space homology, okay? Now, yeah. What I'm saying is that, but that here on this, on Rabinowitz Fleur, we have a product, we also have a co-product and they also satisfy Sullivan's relation. Now that is, that is not a consequence of any associativity, yeah? So, so it's on, on, on two different levels. So we do have a product co-product on Rabinowitz Fleur, which satisfies Sullivan's relation. I see. And that needs to be proved directly, I as see. I showed you in this picture, but then, if you just look at the product and you restrict it to those two factors, then mm -hmm. you see the, the loop product and co-product and then associativity of the product here gives you Sullivan's relation between those on reduced loop homology. Okay. I see. So it's, it's essentially, uh, let me think, but uh, it feels they're connected, these two Sullivan relations. Yes, like, one like extends the other, yes. Well, yeah, one extends the other. Uh, uh -huh. I see. Okay, but there's uh -huh. an extra claim, which is the point yeah. red duality in some sense. Yeah. Yeah. I so, so I mean, another way of saying it, we can obtain Sullivan's relation on reduced loop homology in two different ways. First of all, we can say, okay, we take it is obtained by restricting Sullivan's relation that we have on Rabinowitz Fleur for the product and co product. Mm -hmm. it, it restricts to Sullivan's relation here. Yeah. But there's this other point of view, which was the first one that we had found, is that we can also deduce it just from associativity of the product here. Right. Yeah. yeah? So it's kind of funny that the same Sullivan's relation on reduced loop homology arises in two different ways. Mm -hmm. One is part of associativity of the product on Rabinowitz Fleur. The other one is as a restriction of Sullivan's relation on Rabinowitz Fleur, which are two different right. things. Right. Yeah. I see. So yeah. So following this point, um, what I wanted to say is that the loop space, the homology of the free loop space, the string topology, uh, has a very rich algebraic structure, like classical string topology. Right. There are Lie brackets and so yes. on. Uh, yes. There's a BV algebra structure, and then there's a question about lifting these to the chain level. These are related to the lean type conjecture and so on, and. Um, so Ralph has this package in the Ralph Kaufman in, in the um, in the Hochschild setting, right? Mm -hmm. Which essentially solves the what 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 might be known as the cyclic Deline conjecture. So that means the BV algebra structure of string topology, you can lift to the chain level, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. To this um, higher uh, uh, structure up to higher coherences. And what we have been uh, observing recently is that this same structure extends to the uh, Tate construction, uh -huh. right? And this is like a chain level BV algebra that resolves both the goresky hingston the loop product and the mixed products, which I guess some of these are, uh, we haven't talked about these, right? But they're mm -hmm. uh, mixed, mixed operations. Uh, so, yeah, I, I just wanted to say that that this yeah. this yeah. more much more structure. Uh, it's much more structure related yes, yes. to the BV yeah. algebra structure. Um, right. And and our our observation is in the um, simply connected case. 
mm -hmm. uh, for now because it uses hog shield uh, mm -hmm. chain models. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh -huh. yeah. Yes. Yes. So, so this is, uh, of course, we expect that also uh, the additional structure uh, is, of course, also here. There's certainly a BV operator there, and you can do equivariant versions of uh, of this. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. Kai, actually, uh, I, I just remembered something else I wanted to say or ask you is that um, in this Hochschild setting, we also get a pairing, uh, like an, an honest pairing in the analog of the Rabinovitz floor homology. Okay, a pairing, like, and then you can prove that the structure we get is compatible with this pairing. Like you get a cyclic A infinity algebra and so on. So I wonder, now I wonder if this implies, if this somehow implies uh, the Sullivan relation at the unbounded complex. And actually, um, th that yeah, was my comment. Ahead. So actually, I think, I think, I don't know if Manuel mentioned that, uh, but just taking this package back from 2006, actually, where I did some computations in the algebraic context, what you call the Sullivan relation just comes out. I mean, this is just a computation on the algebraic side that you get these two terms and we also have a four term relation. Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of nice, so th those exist back then and there. So, and then uh, we do have some results about your four. Uh, so I don't know what I'm supposed to say or not say. So, but uh, we have a better understanding of the four term relation because actually that's a homotopy and we know what the homotopy is. So we can actually, and that is related to some, infin uh, some infinity structure. So we do know that. So let me reiterate. I mean, I can, I don't know if you, I can screen share. Uh, can I screen share? Um, yeah. If I stop sharing, probably yes. Yes, yes, I think you could. Um, I'll, let me just stop sharing. Mm -hmm. So let's see, I want to share which one. So am I sharing the right one? Yes, so you should be seeing this one, right? Yes, yes. So this is sort of just the computation. So this is your. Uh, Sullivan relation, you just compute with the 2006 paper. I'll show you where that's in the 2006 paper. And then your four term relation. So, this is a preprint uh, version of something I'm doing with uh, Manuel Rivera and, and Zheng Fang. So, uh, and this is just uh, using uh, the setup in this action on the whole show tape. And this is your four term relation. So, this is exactly the four term relation. And inside the four term relation, there is a homotopy, which we know what it is. Uh, which uh -huh. is and I don't know if I, can, if I say this, you know, whatever, then uh, cite us for it. But uh, that, that uh, your homotopy relation is the M3 that uh, Manuel and Zheng Fang found. So, that's a uh -huh. the homotopy for the four term relation. So that's known. And then, uh, so I can show you where the computation for this infinitesimal product was done was in this, uh, I guess it, it's, when did it appear? Uh, so this, uh, so, the, so this is the, sort of the computation I showed there is a specialization of this computation. And this is from this paper in uh, 2007. So I think it was in the archive in 2006. So, but we, we set up a, a general package of computing these things. And you can actually compute the product and co-product. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, I, I recently wrote a paper like in, 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 in 2018 where I spell out what the co-product actually means on this algebraic version. I'll stop sharing. Uh, on this algebraic version. And if you specialize this, and then that computation just tells you that these, that, that these relations hold because this whole package operates. So these are just universal things that you get. But it's kind of okay. nice. I mean, you can, I, you know, I can show you those those two relations again. So I, I'd have to. Are you okay with sharing this? Uh, um, can't ask anything. But Manuel, are you okay with sharing sort of this? Yeah, of course. I don't care. <laughs> okay, okay. Then I'll share again <laughs> and in a bigger fashion. So now you can actually read. So these are these are these four terms which you can. So uh, it's just the same type of computation. So. Uh, and it's actually very strikingly similar to your pictures, which look like cacti to me. But uh, here, these just are just the symbols for the co-product and the opposite co-product. These are just two of the same. 
and then the product is I forgot where the simplest for the product. But anyway, so you compose them. This is this, and you get this one-dimensional guy. So it already collapses all your boundaries, and you, see, you readily see that this has two two lines, and then uh, the dotted lines tell you how to identify this as these two terms given together on the right hand side of the Sullivan relation. And then uh, when you look at the thing that's dual to the M3 product that uh, uh, Zheng Feng and Manuel uh, wrote down, so then actually, sorry, this is the M3. So no, this is dual. This has two ins and two outs. Mm -hmm. If you take two ins and two outs, then you can look at the boundary of this and you get these four terms. And then using this dictionary here, which tells you what the co-products and products are, uh, you can write out the four terms as exactly those four terms involving, I think I, 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 involving the, the co-product, the opposite co-product, and the product. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, okay. it, and it was surprising. I mean, it took it took a it took a long time to actually write out what the what these co-products. So you, you know, because it looks like you just have co-products and products, but the fun thing is that you have co-products, opposite co-products, and products. Can you say it again? You have co-products and opposite co-products where you switch. Right, delta of. I think that's the, didn't you have that in your four term relation as well? Oh, oh, sorry. Yes, 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 yes. Where, where, where you where you switch the the, the inputs? Where yes. you switch the inputs? Yeah, so, uh, so the the out the outputs of the of the copro. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. Yes, yes, we have that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yes. that's exactly all, 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 hard yeah, to identify which, which was something which also annoyed us because all the other relations we can write nicely without any uh, any transposition and and. Uh, right. And this one we cannot, yeah. Right, so. you have to. But you know, uh -huh. this is actually the thing you can see it. So you can you can uh -huh. um, iterate these by sort of putting a circle around this, and then yeah, you, you can see if this is a co-product or uh, an opposite co-product. So that uh -huh. follows automatically in this formalism. It's really nice. And uh -huh. um, we also proved that this thing is actually a double bracket. It has a Leibniz identity. So you probably see the same thing. So it's kind of it's kind of cute. So this is, and it all follows from this. And the the things look very similar to yours. And maybe I oh, know I closed the one for the um, for the one for the 2008 because there's something funny there because you contract some some of these in your hexagons and so on you contract some things down to zero, and this some um, special sort of normalization conditions on how how you put weights on things and then they start disappearing. So this is this is already the normalized version. That's why you only see the four sides. If you don't normalize, you would see exactly sort of these blown up versions of things. <laughs> kind of cute. So we're we're computing the same things, which is which is funny. Well, this is <clears throat> it's great actually. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, uh, actually, Kai. Yes. We I just realized um, we never mentioned or you never mentioned uh, involutivity. Uh, if you apply yes. the product and then the co-product, do you yes. get zero? Yeah. Um, I don't think so. So can I tell you what we uh, do, get? Do, do, do you know what? Yeah, yeah because I, I don't think yeah. you get zero. Right. So this is, this is well, algebraic is simply connected, so it's very special. But there's something uh -huh. different that happened here. In the algebraic setting, when you work with Frobenius algebras and Hochschild complexes, yeah. most of these relations always hold strict at the chain level. Uh -huh. Right? Right. Usually, of course, there are some it's things that are called up to homotopy, but many of these relations hold strictly at the chain level, which is useful, useful for computations, actually. In any case, when you try to compute the involutivity condition, at least in the algebraic setup, I did it a few years ago, and you get something which is a boundary at the chain level, even in this algebraic setup. So it's zero on homology, but already in the algebraic setup, you get some, um, it's not zero strictly at the chain level. And I've always thought this is very interesting. I, I'm i not sure if, yeah. No, but I think um, Kai, Kai but, mentioned but, that, right? I mean, you, you had exactly a similar thing that you were saying that, uh, right, so I'm, try, I'm trying to hunt down a picture. So the, the um, it's, there is a, you can think about this, uh, the failure of the co-product of being um, 
a chain sorry uh, of being so that thing is not close it's it's a chain right it's not yes. i have these arguments with uh, with manuel for a while see i don't care if my chains are closed or not they give me operations on the chain level so they might not descend but you know yeah. that's uh, uh, a good thing but uh, kai by I'm close uh, he's meaning uh that's not a chain map if you don't kill by constant loops yes, right, yes. Okay, okay. yeah but the yeah. whole point is you have this chain on the chain complex right and it's sort yeah. of into it's a homotopy between two things it's just like the usual uh you know um yeah uh, cup one product is between the two cup zeros right i mean this is so so this and this interpolates exactly between left mother multiplication on uh, by constants and right multiplication by constants yes. with, with this E. So it is this kind of homotopy. So it doesn't give you, it, uh, unless you kill those things, it's not zero, but that's because it doesn't commute, right? I mean, somehow the whole point is that the, that the left multiplication by uh, the zero part and the right multiplication don't commute. Why would they? It's, mm -hmm. so it's, it's not a commutative algebra. And so the, you get this homotopy uh, expression for the for the co-product. So, and then many of these things are the same way. So this N three product again uh, it gives this gives this thing. It lives on the chain level, has this boundary components. It's a homotopy between stuff. So your four term relation, and then if you kill, and I think you did that masterfully, uh, which parts to kill off so that it becomes a homology or cohomology operation. But in a sense, all these equations and these things exist already on the on the just the pure chain level without the, these things actually being cycles. Mm -hmm. And for them, sometimes I, you know, Manu, may, maybe we all agree, but I, I got this from, from Boris Sigan that, you know, cycles are important. So it's sort of uh, just uh, non-cycles are important if you have some homotopies between stuff that has boundaries. Right. You should look at non-cycles as, as homotopies between boundaries. So. This is yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I completely agree with that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm starting to appreciate these this point uh, uh, these days. Actually, I've always I was always interested in things that pass to homology, so you can compute in a smaller vector space. Yeah. Uh, but I, I'm yeah, I'm starting to appreciate this point. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so but you I'm, don't I'm, think it's involutive? I'm 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 curious about it. I haven't hadn't given it much thought, but I I had looked at it a bit and it, uh, it didn't seem to me but uh, but then I, I have not really thought it thought much about it I, I didn't immediately see it, it being evolutive on the but you're saying it is uh, yeah I, I, I computed this as a grad student I remember at the algebraic level and it was in it was a boundary at the chain level I see. if you so apply so the they, product and then the co-product and I, it will, it's always interesting I've always thought that this boundary should contain uh, actually, non homotopy invariant information. Uh -huh. uh, mm -hmm. kind okay. of, I think, in, I mean, in the moduli space picture, you do see like moduli here in some sense, right? In the, um, in the involutive, yeah, in the involutive picture where you mm -hmm. have the, Taurus with one input and one output. Yes, 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 yes. I mean, I yeah, yeah. I mean, in the in the equivariant setting, I've I've seen that, and we we know that it's involutive, and I uh, somehow, uh, yeah, I. Uh, in the equivariant case, it is. Yeah, in the equivariant case, it is. Yes, there, there, there it's, it clearly is. Um, yeah. But you're saying in the non-equivariant, it's also involutive. So that. Yeah, I think. Yeah. At least in the simply connected case, maybe subtleties happen. Maybe, maybe I was, I, I don't remember, was it a while ago? At some point I had wondered and I'd looked at yeah. some examples, but maybe I had also looked at non simply connected examples. And yeah, maybe, it maybe it would be, be uh, the same kind of subtlety that you observed in the circle case mm. uh, might pop out in the involutivity equation. Mm -hmm. And that's something I didn't see uh, because I, I, I did yeah. not think about the non-simply connected case. So maybe. OK, I need to get get back to that because I have a number of examples computed yeah. and I mean, and, and, and I, but I'll, I'll go but over what, the computation again, actually. Yeah. And, yeah. But 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 this is actually great that you that you have all those things already in your. Yeah. So, so I, I apologize for not being aware of all this literature. It's uh, um, we are we are just uh, not none of us is experts on on on, on this homotopy 
right and we're not experts on the simplex yeah, so, <laughs> so we just stumble across all those things and even what i just mentioned in the very end this relation to this work by by poirier and, and charla this only uh, we only realized that uh, two months ago like by 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 chance and uh, that and but now you're telling me it's even appearing much further back uh, so so we'll of course be very happy to put that also also in our paper and i would also also like to look at that yeah so it would be great if you could send me maybe just a brief list of what are the relevant papers of yours uh, to to look at because i i definitely want to look at that because we probably can we learn can some that. stuff from that yeah so, although the setup is different you start from hochschild and uh, so on but but i mean on the algebraic level of course it should all uh, match yeah. and be yeah. the same so so for, for instance do you have a good name for four term relation because the name four term relation is of course her horrible right uh, there's no we didn't give it a name right we didn't give it a name <laughs> i think we call it the square i mean uh, you 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 can give it a name i can call it the the, the rivera kaufman relation yeah so so <laughs> it's exciting that exciting anything. that it's exciting that string topology is kind of has a new life now right like yeah. there's so many yeah. interesting questions and yes uh, and and I mean, as you as you see, maybe the way I presented this, we come we come uh, to all this algebraic structure by bits and pieces, really. I mean, we we started very naively and think about it, and we got further and so on. And uh, and and even Dennis Sullivan, he had not written down this four-term relation when he introduced this product in co-prod. He had right. said they should have said, and 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 this Sullivan's relation has a nice interpretation. Yeah, it says that the uh, co-product is a derivation with respect to the product. So. So that's why probably he thought of that this relation should hold. Yeah, and this four-term relation, I don't, I don't have any good interpretation of that. Do you? Yeah, it's it's the it's, it's the the, hom the homotopy of this thing is uh, the M three product. So, so okay. if, if you yeah, if you go to our um this and the, and the so M three product is very very natural. I mean, this is what Zeng Feng and and it's very and natural. Are, it's kind of a amazing how we we all discovered this in different settings because ralph also has the m3 product uh written differently uh we got it from a different perspective so this is the, the thing if you take this tate construction in our algebraic setting you have a product right which combines chas sullivan and goreski hingston even in the algebraic setup this product is not strictly associative at the chain level and this associativity is destroyed or it doesn't hold because of certain mixed products, mm -hmm. the ones that combine chains and co-chains, okay? Mm -hmm. And then you write down the obstruction or the homotopy for the associativity. This is what we call the M3 product. Mm -hmm. And this M3 is what gives the homotopy in this four-term relation after dualizing appropriately or whatever. So, mm -hmm. so okay. in some sense, okay. it's related to this. You can write, yeah, I think you can, you can even do it in your setting, like, uh, like related to the associativity yeah, at the chain mm -hmm. level yes. of the product in Rabinovitz in the complex. Yes. No, that, that will work. Just because it's the same algebra. <laughs> yeah. But we, what we're doing is universal algebra computations. So yeah, 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 right. Of, of course, fairly, course, course sure work out the same work way. Out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right, because I mean, the computations, the pictures I showed you, they're universal algebra computations. They sort of right. don't care what the representation is they live in. Totally, uh, yeah. So yeah. once you abstract it away from the particular uh, Tate Hosha, then you're going to do the same computation. So, so I'm, I'm starting to believe now that all the algebraic structure is actually um the same algebraic structure that the free loop space has but now in the tate hochschild setting together with a pairing or point care duality mm -hmm. in this tate yes. construction and i think that's because all we... right i mean so so I, I, about this pairing is this pairing no is this so pairing in... should this pairing be be equivalent to having Poincaré duality or uh... I, I don't know because in our case, this pairing uses the 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 filtration that you have in in the Hochschild setup. 
uh, which is an extra an extra filtration. It's not total degree. It's you have these monomials, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. And you can filter by the length of monomials. Yeah. So this yeah. pairing takes uses this filtration, you know. Uh, so I don't know how to. I'm not sure how to interpret it uh, topologically yet. I think you could. You could. So 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 it it is a pairing on the Tate. Pairing on the Tate, oh, on the Tate. construction. Mm -hmm. You get that's in my paper with uh, Sheng Feng Wang. It's mm -hmm. let me say it again. It's a pairing in the Tate construction induced by the pairing of the underlying Frobenius algebra. So you should think of it a pairing in the Tate Hock Schild construction induced by the Poincare duality of the underlying manifold in some sense. Mm -hmm. And then all the operations are compatible with this pairing, cyclically compatible. But okay, but but you're doing the, I mean, okay, in, in our yeah. terminology, you're doing the Tate construction on the on the chains on the loop space, not on the manifold, really, right? Yeah, on the loop space. And and, and and there you don't have a pairing, or is this pairing somehow trivial on all the? Uh, no, you do have a pairing, but in some sense. Okay, in some sense, you're using a filtration of the free loop space by finite dimensional manifolds. In some sense, because that's what the length of the Hochschild monomials mm -hmm. correspond to. You know, yes. it's like approximating your, but your free loop the space by products. So, so you have a pairing whenever you truncate. Basically, you're saying, and uh, yeah, essentially, well, a pairing, but 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 a then filtered it's pairing. It's zero most of the time, except when you pair two parts of the filtration, which are of the, in the same, you know, like a Hochschild chain of length n and a Hochschild co-chain of length n. There mm -hmm. it's non-zero and so on. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And you, yeah. Okay. So I think topologically might correspond to something like, um, Looking at the at the finite dimensional approximations of the free loop space, you know, by products of of the manifold with itself, like the mm. co-simplicial mm. thing. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly what it is. But I mean, maybe in your case, but uh, I don't know how much time we have. Uh, and and it was floor. I mean, are you using sort of some sort of cutoff or something to make stuff like finite dimensional? Yes, it's yeah, also. Uh, I mean. We we have it is constructed as a direct limit construction. So so, right. so, so precisely uh, the pictures I drew for this V-shaped Hamiltonian, yeah. they only have finitely many uh, generators, the chain complexes. And then right. we let slopes go to infinity and take a direct limit. So this is very similar. So you could think, you know, at each truncated space we have you have a duality and then you take the limit of this. Well, yeah, that, that's what actually exactly what we have. We have a duality at every truncated space, but I never saw thought of it as a but but this is the same thing then, right? It's a uh, yeah, that's right. It must be. I mean, I'm having a duality because we from from the space to its dual. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's, it's equivalent to a pairing. Yeah, it's, I think it's so. equivalent to a pairing. So okay, no, I think that yeah, then 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 it is also in our in our picture. Yeah, yeah, this because this is exactly how it's coming up. We have this. Right. Is constructed as a direct limit of finite dimensional things, and uh, for each one of them, we have a canonic uh, duality. Right, exactly. And, right. and in, in, in our picture for Rabino, it's, it's really it's this V-shaped Hamiltonian. You just flip, basically. Mm -hmm. You just you just do a reflection. So it's extremely geometric. Okay. So, so I'll somehow. have to look at that. That's interesting. Yeah. The other thing which I like is which is very close to stuff I thought about years ago for for open closed string topology. I mean, there are these. Uh, there are these punctures which appear, and they are very reminiscent of your indices appearing yielding an Euler class. I mean, you can just do a computation in this algebraic setting, and you figure out when you glue something together, a puncture appears, and that puncture gets an Euler class. And uh, the same type of calculation tells you actually what the obstruction to the um, to the Goresky Hingston co-product is. Uh, because you sort of want to want to extend one algebraic operation uh, as a DG operation. And then you know what it is on the cellular level, the thing that operates, you know what the boundary is. So you know what the algebraic operation should be if it's a DG operation. 
And that actually also computes, uh, should be very close to the computation you did. That tells you that these boundary terms of the um, goretzky hingston bracket come with Euler classes. Mm -hmm. Okay, that I did not really understand. I must confess. Um, uh, so yeah, this is in this in this paper. Uh, explain this note on the Hochschild uh, action. Maybe I should. Maybe maybe I can screen share again. So uh, just to make it just so, so you can see a picture. I don't want to go through the computation. I, I just wanted to say I I might have to go teach very soon, but <laughs> I can keep discussing. Okay and. So this is this is uh, the co product is just this homotopy between these two guys, and yes. on this one you have nothing. So you have to ask yourself how does this operate? But you know that it has to operate as this operation going to the boundary, and then you can compute what this operation is by just general general uh, definition, which was there before. And then you can see that the new operation will be computed like this, where you have a uh, the Casimir element, so the, um, the the form for the pairing here, and then you see that you immediately get an Euler element as an as an operation. It's mm -hmm. sort of a computation; it's not even a choice. Mm -hmm. So the the theorem is if if whatever you want to define as a representation is a DG operation, and you know how this acts, then you know how the two boundaries have to act because it's a DG fashion, and you can compute that this is the action. And so if you define this action this way. Uh, then, then you're good. So this is also in these 2006 papers, in a sense, it's written there that this is immediately implies that you know what these actions are and that the things that are appearing are Euler classes mm -hmm. if you're working with a Frobenius algebra. Okay. Fascinating. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's just kind of funny. It's, it's because these things then appear, these empty boundary components kind of if you haven't, but now now I can say something geometric and then probably I'll just shut up. But if you have, so this is actually the way I came from this is like from um, modernized spaces of curves and surfaces with boundaries and boundary points. So if you have a boundary without a boundary point and you're looking at, you know, at this, you can't distinguish it from a puncture sort of conformally. You can just, yeah. just goes away. And then the whole point is if you have punctures living in the surface, then you can compute that the contributions for those punctures should be Euler classes. And that's exactly what happens. So if you had, if you do this computation, you figure out that actually what you did is you converted a boundary component. So you're shrinking your loop to a constant loop. That loop shrinking is a the loop is a boundary component. You shrink it to a point because it's a constant loop. That makes it a puncture. And mm -hmm. punctures, we know what they are supposed to be. They're just insertions of, of Euler classes. Okay. So that should be the same thing like in some flexible theory. So it should be the same thing that you that you get that. Uh -huh. That okay. That I would definitely like to understand because this feels like, this feels like it should be very yeah. It, as you say, it should be precisely uh, uh, what one sees in symplectic field theory. Um, right, right. Because this mm -hmm. phenomenon of, of of some actual boundary components shrinking to 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 punctures, we 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 also see and uh, right. Yeah. And that, that's what I'm saying. So what happens yeah. there? The boundary shrink. So the, the boundary of this co-product has empty boundary components and they shrink to punctures and then you know mm -hmm. the punctures have to give you mm -hmm. classes. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. All right, I'll leave you, but Good. this was interesting. You should have done this. This was a great talk, to Kai. Thank other. you so much for well it was worries. a great discussion. Thank you so much. So so yeah. if you could just send me some pointers to what papers to look at. And maybe maybe we can actually continue this discussion after I've, I've had a bit of a look at your papers because I would really like to of uh, yeah. like to understand this yeah, i was also really thinking i was also thinking right now maybe we should be thinking maybe in a year or two organizing some string topology workshop so we can all get together and discuss all these perspectives because everything's converging in different directions right yes so indeed uh maybe we should have that in mind for the future yeah yeah I, I'm, I'm also maybe i'm also interested in that but but let's in, in on on shorter notice i think i would really like to keep this discussion maybe uh, yeah, going definitely. right now because I, we're kind of revising our papers and and putting some of new stuff that we figure into it and i, I would really like to also uh, understand how it all relates to the stuff you did and uh, yeah we can so, we can do that. Okay, yeah, great, so, great. Yeah, yeah. I'll, uh, we'll write something. Okay, great. Um, okay, thanks a lot again. Thank you, Kai. Good, Good to see fun. you again. <laughs> hey, thanks for the talk. <laughs> we'll be in yeah. touch. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye.